Hi, welcome to week three of our study of a life well lived. As we've been looking at uh, Paul's final days, as we've been reflecting upon uh, how Paul looked back over his life, and then how is it that we might consider uh, looking back over our life and looking at what truly matters? How do we put those pr right priorities in the right place? place. And so today we do come to the conclusion of our study, and so we are going to be taking a look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, is that as we look at the very last writings of Paul, and what is it that's on his mind, what's on his heart, what is it that is filling his very thoughts as he looks to what Christ has in store. And so let us go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, bless us as we dive deeply into your word. May we continue to reflect upon what it is and what it means to us today. That for certainly your truth is there for us always. And we pray that you would just help us to apply that to our daily lives, that we may continue to walk closer to you. It's in your son's name that we pray. And so today, as we get started, I invite you to go ahead and start with this reflection or discussion question if somebody else is there with you. You're welcome to pause the video as you do so. But what I want you to think about is to you, what are the markers of a life well lived? Now, what are those you know, things that kind of tell you that you're on that right track? When you look back over your life, is that what will you use to measure your life. And so there may be many different things that came out as that a part of the legacy that you live, you know, that you leave behind. Maybe it's, you know, how, uh, how your children have been raised. Maybe it's by the amount of impact that you've had. Maybe it's a part of your volunteerism or your vocation or many other different things. But at the same time, we hear that very reminder from Paul is that as we look in Philippians 3, that as he reminded us that what is truly important, that righteousness that comes not from us, but that righteousness which is a gift of faith through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so today is that we want to be simply thinking about what are those things that we deeply value and appreciate and what is it that Christ has given and blessed us with that he might use our lives for his greater glory. And so today as we look at the Apostle Paul is that we step into first, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And so we look at verses 6 through 8 to start us off. That Paul writes this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. That I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Is it gone? Are all of those words of Paul from Philippians 1, as he said, is that whether it is better for me to go and be with Christ in heaven or to remain with you, is that I don't know which to choose, but I know for your sake is that there is more meaningful labor and work for me. So I am convinced that the Lord shall deliver me <laughs> and that I shall again come to you. That Paul no longer is speaking with that optimism of all that was there. So that 2 Timothy is one that Paul knows where things are heading, and he knows that the end has come. And so now he prepares himself with his final goodbyes to his beloved brother in Christ, Timothy, a younger pastor and one who he had poured out his life to and in so many ways has continued to now train up to continue that mission. And so as we begin to think about the fact that Paul's, Paul's perspective has changed, that what is it that's on his heart and on his mind of his final words to Timothy and to the church, that if this is his one of his final letters. 
And so let's go ahead and let's dive deeper in to this surrounding area. Don't worry, we'll come back to this verse of the verses 6 through 8. But so what we want to look at is in 2 Timothy 3. Then what does Paul begin to lay out? He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred, sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So what's in Paul's heart and mind? See, throughout this third chapter, and even the fourth chapter, is that we begin to hear this common rephrase, but as for you. That he says it in chapter 3, verse 10. He says it here in chapter 3, verse 14. He says it again in chapter 4, verse 5. That Paul begins to set up a distinction of how Timothy is called to live versus how this world lives. And so Paul begins to continue to make that contrast and distinction. And so what is it that would make Timothy's life one that is well lived as well? Then what does Paul now say? He says, continue in what you have learned. Continue in what you have been firmly believed. Why? So that Paul reminds Timothy of two things. That he reminds him of that fact that God has blessed him with those who have instructed him. Who's on Paul's heart and his mind is that those who have taught Timothy, not only himself, that as he says in verse 10, that you have followed my teaching, you have my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfast, my persecutions and sufferings. Is that Paul knows that Timothy has learned firsthand from him of what it means to be a person and a child of God. Then now not only does Paul refer to that fact of the training that he has given, but that whole fact from whom is a plural, is that those people who've had that connection. See, Paul has already referenced earlier is that Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, and all that they had done for him. That Paul's mind begins to drift to Timothy and raising him up, raising up the next generation to come. That this isn't something that Paul on his deathbed kind of finally said, we should probably make sure others are prepared. No, this is what Paul has been working for. That he's been raising up the next generation, concerning himself with the people that surround him and the people that are the support of those that are those very children of God. See, what does Paul's heart and mind begin to reflect upon, upon those important people in our lives? Not only his, but also theirs. As he celebrates what has now come down to Timothy through this great cloud of witnesses that surrounds. See, I might be able to put it in this way, is that if I asked you, what, what are your top three or four sermons that you've ever heard. Don't worry, I'll give you, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Is that some of us, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> but if I were to say, name your top five or 10 people who have most influenced your faith, is that those names and faces might begin to click so quickly. <laughs> See, sometimes I get that fact that somebody comes and says, well, it's just like what you said in your sermon last week, Pastor. And even I have to say, what did, what did I say in my sermon last week? <laughs> See, we are shaped by the people that surround us. Those who have raised us, those who have influenced us, those who have poured themselves into us. 
And so Paul reminds Timothy of those people as well as that very gift of the scripture. That what is that measure of a life well lived? That we have grown closer, not just with the physical people that are here, but that we have grown closer to our God, closer in our faith, that we have grown to be what? To be the very equipped and complete people that God has made us to be. Why? Because the scriptures make us to be ready and prepared for all things. Now, what does Paul begin to take it back to? All the way from infancy has Timothy been brought up in this word, and he has not yet graduated. And so what does Paul's you know, heart and mind direct this to? That how is it that we are called to be, be those who are known by the people that we abide with? How are we those that are known for our time that we have spent with Jesus in his word. So that's one measure that Paul begins to think and reflect upon. But then secondly, he goes on to say this in, in chapter 4, that he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, and with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears that they will accumulate for, uh, for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wandering off into myths. But as for you, Always be sober-minded, enduring suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. See, Paul goes on to continue to call Timothy with the great very calling of this fact that Paul is now ready to depart, is that he calls Paul, you know, Timothy with all sincerity to be ready for what now comes. And so with all of that solemn charge, what does Paul tell Timothy to be about? See, once again, you see that this difference of, but as for you, that there are some that are seeking to please themselves, there are some that are happy to have people tell them what they want to be true. It may not be true, but it's just what makes them pleased and happy and able to live the life that they want to live. But what does Paul begin to bring out not only that we are to be dedicated to truth, dedicated to those things that truly stand the test of time and not are not the product of our changing whims and values and our continued you know, time-oriented realities, but to the truth that stands the test of time. But what does Paul charge Timothy with? is that Paul charges him to preach the word, is that all of these other things kind of tell him how to preach the word, is that he is to be ready in and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, but what is it all about? Is that your life is to be one that proclaims Jesus, that you are a herald, Timothy, that you do not get to pick the message, is that you do not get to kind of shape it to fit you. No, you are that very herald that does not bring the good advice of Jesus. No, that you bring the good news of Jesus. And I think that same thing is true for us. Now, not all of us are pastors, but the fact is, is that are not all of us called to preach the word with our actions, with our care, with our lives that others may come to know the very gifts that are ours in God. And so what does it say in Matthew 5? Is that let your light shine so that they may be directed to glorify your Father in heaven. <laughs> but that's what that first thing is there, that he calls Timothy to be about caring for others, that others may hear and know. But he also says to fulfill your ministry. 
not to fulfill Titus's ministry, not to fulfill Luke's ministry, not to fulfill Mark's ministry or anybody else, but to fulfill your ministry, Timothy. That how many of us look at the lives of others and we wish that we could be more like them, that we can have a job more like them, that we can have the skills like them, that we could have the time off or the vacations that they have or whatever it might be, that we feel that we wish that we could be more like them. That I've heard it well said, that when we reach heaven and when we stand before our Lord, he will not ask, why were you not more like so-and-so? Or why weren't you more like them? No, he will ask us, why were you not more like you? The one that I created, the one that I shaped, the one I gifted you in your unique way. Too often we are judging our life that we are hitting the marks of others. No, what is it that Paul calls our minds to? What's on his heart and his mind? That we might be those who are living our vocations our roles, our responsibilities, our relationships, and then we within those relationships might share that goodness, that gospel, that simply said that, you know, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words, that our actions are that very preaching, but at the same time, is that preach the gospel for you must use words. That I'm not saying that you have to get preachy or that somehow you have to be standing out on a, you know, a street corner yelling at people. Is that, no, what is it? <laughs> to preach is simply a word to proclaim. That how do our lives, our words, our actions proclaim the glory of Christ? That he has came and forgiven us, changed us, and loved us so. But so Paul goes on after our initial section, that then he begins to say this. He says, Do your best to come to me soon, Timothy, for Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone off to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for my ministry. Is that get Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you bring the when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Is that like as many other letters, what does Paul begin to conclude? Is that his greetings and his notes and his personal realities of those that he shares his life with? That Paul begins to think about those that matter to him, just like any of us when it is our time to go and be with the Lord. We think of those who are near and dear to us, and we want them to be there with us. But the fact is, as Paul, Paul goes on to say, that he realizes that some for ill reasons have left him, some for good reasons have, have gone to carry out more ministry, some at his own very order have gone. But what does Paul feel? Paul feels that aloneness, that kind of isolation that is there. That he says this, that at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. See, what does Paul begin to reflect? What's on his heart and mind? Is that Paul feels that very fact that he is alone. That just like Jesus in Gethsemane, Paul is having his own moment where he is being deserted by many. That he is feeling the weight of that very cross that he himself bears. But even in the midst of this is that Paul still reflects his Lord 
as he has may it not be charged against them as jesus said father forgive them for they know not what they do see paul's mind is still on those in his life and that very care and desire that they may have that but where does paul's strength come from that where is it that he gets his assurance is that he calls upon the Lord who stood by him. That though many of his friends had deserted him, many of his friends were simply not with him, though he felt alone, is that what a friend we have in Jesus. For he stood strong with Paul. That what is it that Paul sees? Paul sees is that the Lord alone rescued him in his hour of need. The Lord is there in the midst of these things. That even though Paul now knows that the end has come, that his faith of what is to come is still just as solid as ever. And don't we pray that that same thing would be true of us. And so we think about what is it that Paul's words here communicate. See, I love... you know. I love the very words that Timothy Keller once shared within one of his sermons on this topic of 2 Timothy 4. Is that he brought out two very key things that I've added you know, a couple of different resources to. But what is it that he brings out? Is that Paul still sees death as an adventure. <laughs> that there is still more to come, there is more blessing ahead, that there is things that is waiting him, and he is not afraid, even though he does not know all the answers. See, as Timothy Keller said, and I loved, you know, loved this reflection, is the very fact that, you know, the very fact that Jesus, you know, did not you know, proclaim this idea of death as the Lion King. <laughs> you know, that Lion King, it's just the circle of life, is that don't worry, we're all going to die, and someday you're going to fertilize the grass, and it's just going to be beautiful, and Elton John's going to sing a wonderful song. It's the circle of life. <laughs> Buck up and be happy. <laughs> no, that's not the kind of reality that Jesus brings. No, Jesus brings the very promise that death has been defeated. That it's not just something that we need to accept and just kind of learn to deal with. No, death has been defeated. That death has been changed. That Christ is there with us. And so therefore we have a hope and a promise that God is there. And what is it that we continue to hear is that these are a, this is a wonderful quote, is that death used to be an executioner, but Jesus made death just a gardener. That we are like the tulip bulbs, that if we are planted, sure enough that we shall blossom once again. That Jesus has changed this thing that we fear. He's changed it to something that is not that very fact of something that we must be deathly afraid of, but something that he has now conquered. That death has no dominion over us. That I love how Martin Luther once went ahead and described it. Is that he kind of, in a rhetorical way, is that he uses the dialogue of God arguing with death and proclaiming what is now true. And so Luther writes, is that death, I am now your death. Hell, I am your plague. The stone upon which you will be ground to dust. Yes, I intend to be your hell. That you have filled my people with fear so that they do not want to die. For watch out that I am on the other side. When you kill someone, I will kill you. When you say, I have gobbled up that person, I have swallowed down Do Dr. Martin, boast as you will, death. For in my eyes they are not dead whom you have killed, but they are asleep. And so softly I can wake them with just one little finger. Christ has changed 
And so what is it that we hear? We hear of a friend who goes with us. One who is there, no matter if we have always lived a life well lived, is that he is the one who gives us a righteousness and a victory that we have not won. Then what does Paul proclaim? That while life is a struggle, for he describes it as a fight, he describes it as a race, he describes it as something that we need to protect. But what does Paul proclaim in his words today? That he says that I have fought the fight, I have finished the race, that I have kept safe and secure that very faith, that gift and treasure that God has given to me. That though life may be difficult, though we might find ourselves in those times of struggle, that we have a hope that goes beyond. Why? Because we have a Jesus that went beyond. That when he stepped into the life of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, on that time after Lazarus had died, is that to Martha, is that he gave words of truth and assurance. To Mary, he gave tears of care and compassion. And as he stood there before the very grave of one near and dear to him, is that Jesus not only found himself overwhelmed with grief, but it says that he became angry, <laughs> that his nose and nostrils flared with that very fact, that death is something that does, does so much damage in our lives. But Christ took that very, that very anger and he took it to his cross. He took it to his tomb that he did something about that very enemy so that we might live. That whether this is our last day or that is far away, that we can live today with confidence that we can live today for him because he has changed all things and so i end our series and our discussion with this final quotation we shall do so much in the years to come but what have we done today is that we shall give our gold in princely sum but what have we given today we shall lift the heart and dry the tear. We shall plant a hope in the place of fear. We shall speak the words of love and cheer. But what did we speak today? We shall be so kind in the after a while, but what have we been today? We shall bring to each lonely life a smile, but what have we brought today? Tis sweet in the idle dreams to bask, but it's here and now we do our task. Yet this is the thing our souls must ask. What have we done today? Then may our God free us to have that very boldness to live out our faith today as we continue to proclaim and glorify him. May God go with you this week as you continue to fight the good fight, to run that race of faith, as you continue to live that life that has been well lived and well gifted by Christ our Lord. Amen.